the community of a quiet village in Kent was left stunned when the body of a young woman was found lying on the side of the road. This was a brutal and horrific murder. The injuries that that poor girl was subjected to were really upsetting. And for her family, devastation when the truth was revealed. This is a nightmare. This is something you want to wake up from. And this doesn't happen to you. This is something you read about in the paper. That just took the wind right out of our sails. And life ain't been the same since. But would the police be able to get to the bottom of exactly what had happened and bring the young woman's killer to justice? on the outskirts of southeast London lies the picturesque Swanley village. It has a population of approximately 600 people and is only a couple of miles from the commuter town of Swanley. Swanley village is a, a quiet village. It's residential, very lovely and a lovely place to live. Everyone would know each other, people would recognise each other. If anyone did anything, the whole village would know. It's, it's a typical rural village in Kent. The residents of Swanley Village are proud of the place they live in. The village has a strong sense of community. They won contests like the Village in Bloom. They have a village fete. It's quiet, it's got a really lovely community, lovely little school, nice church, lovely people. I've enjoyed living here and hope I'll finish my days here. <laughs> Families have lived here for many decades and it is a safe place to live. Um, yeah. service, where is the help required? Um, I'm in Swanley Village and there's a, a girl or a woman lying uh, at the side of the road, uh, appears to be unconscious. At 11.18pm on the 3rd of October 2012, a group of friends were driving through Swanley Village when they saw a lifeless body on the side of the road. Okay, is she breathing? She's breathing. Uh, we can't feel her breathing. Can't feel the pulse. Lucy's warm. How old is she? Um, I don't, uh, we don't know. She's face down and we don't really want to move her in case right. she's over. Yeah, right, listen. No, I'm telling you to move her now. Roll right, her onto her back for me. Move her, roll her onto her back. Roll her onto her back. In the crucial minutes before the ambulance arrived, the operator tried to help the caller to keep the woman alive. Keep One, going, all right, keep going, and do not stop keep until I tell it. you. Right, right, keep doing this until help arrives. So you said that she's bleeding from the head? Yeah. Okay. You say she's bleeding from her neck? Yeah. Blood everywhere. All right, we're not too far away. We're actually just coming into Swanley now, all right? Okay, thank you. Just keep going until the ambulance person physically takes over. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Once the paramedics had arrived, they did everything possible to save the life of the, the victim. Um, and sadly, that didn't happen. They pronounced life extinct at 11.30 p.m. The victim who had died lying on the side of the road appeared to be a young woman in her early 20s. I got a phone call when I was on my way into work, um, just saying there'd been a body found in the Swanley village area. At the time, we didn't know much more than that. We didn't know if it was suspicious or non-suspicious. To begin with, I'd have expected it to be something like a road traffic collision, or perhaps, um, if it was to go further than that, perhaps a um, non-suspicious death, somebody taken overdose, someone who'd um, been in the pub, had a few too many drinks. But this was no tragic accident, as the victim appeared to have multiple stab wounds, and the police were faced with a possible murder investigation. This was a female with what can only be described as horrific injuries, and I was uncertain how that body had arrived there. The essence of, of our role is to deal with things as quickly as possible because of the potential forensic evidence and other evidence that we can secure. So by the fact that somebody had been left by the side of the road suggested that it happened fairly recently. 
I thought it was an unusual area for a body to be found because generally, whilst murders are fairly scarce around here, any kind of body discovered would be in one of the more built up areas. But not in Swanley Village, it's so rural, it's so in the middle of nowhere, you wouldn't expect there to be any kind of crime of that magnitude. The woman was found with no ID on her, so officers were in the dark about who she was. What the victim was wearing was a dressing gown, pyjama shorts and a vest top. And all she had which was around the body was a set of keys, but there was nothing to identify who this victim was. We knew very little, actually. We had some tattoos, um, which we could conduct some research on, but we didn't have anything else, and that makes things very difficult. Um, we're also very mindful that, clearly, somebody has lost a member of their family uh, and needs to be informed as soon as possible. So that's one of the things that we try and do as quickly as we can to make sure that the victim's family are made aware. As the body was still warm, officers believed that there was a good chance that any killer could still be in the area. There was no way they were letting anyone into the heart of that village at all for many hours to come. Police were guarding each of the entrances. So there was just no traffic going through at all. Inside the cordon, the police were trying to establish what might have happened. The scene itself, from where the first spot of blood was located to where the victim was found, measured approximately 148 metres, which is a vast scene in itself. Along that route, there were various um, pieces of blood that had been left as a trail. And also what was found was two slippers belonging to what we believe was our victim. Since the victim was dressed in her pyjamas, the police began to wonder if she could have been attacked in a property close by and had been running to get help. As part of our investigation, we deployed what we call forensic dogs to the scene in order to identify if there was a blood trail that would take us to a domestic premises. But rather than a local home, the specially trained dogs led the team to a spot in the middle of the quiet village road, indicating that this could be where the attack started. As the blood trail measured approximately 148 metres, there were two options that I considered. The first was that the attack had happened and then the victim had escaped her attacker, or alternatively, whilst walking along that route, she was continually being attacked. The officers needed to work out how the victim had arrived at the scene. As she was found by the side of the road, they had two possible scenarios. Either she'd been driven to the spot or was walking home. The officers began their door-to-door -door inquiries, looking for anyone who may have witnessed the attack. The team was working through the night, and at 2.10 a.m., they received some news. A male walked into Bexley Heath Police Station. He said that he may have been responsible for um, the death of a female, and he gave us the location of where that was. Uh, but what was evident from the person who first spoke to him was that he had blood on his hands and also blood on his face. The man was 23-year-old Adam Wheelerhan. But why would someone hand themselves in? Maybe he'd been involved in a car accident. He wasn't giving much away. I was fairly confident at that stage that this wasn't a coincidence and this was all part and parcel of the same attack. It was difficult to not relate that to the body that had been found a matter of miles away, really. If this was the killer, the police needed to find a motive. And who was the woman? As dawn was breaking in the picturesque Swanley village in Kent, the police continued to search the country lane where the body of a young woman had been found the night before. She was dressed only in pyjamas and a dressing gown and had no form of ID on her, so officers still had no idea who she was. The road was shut off and everyone was asking what was going on. No one really knew. And then we had the police here for a long time clearing out this bank here because I was looking for evidence of the, of the weapon. So it just, yeah, it, it wasn't nice. It wasn't nice. In the 20 years that I've been associated with the area, I've never known any major incident or crime to take place. So it was a shock. As the police sought to discover more about the victim on the village road, a couple of miles away in the town of Swanley, Adele Jarvis was making a discovery of her own. I woke up at 20 past six, normal morning, getting up, going to work. Whenever we go to our bathroom, we have to walk past Natalie's bedroom. And as I do every morning, I went to shut her door, Natalie's bedroom door, and she, I could see she wasn't in her bed. 
Del came downstairs and said, Natalie's not in her bed. I said, okay, well, no worries. She's probably stayed around Gemma's or, you know, gone to one of her mates for the, for the evening. Uh, and Del was quite concerned. And I said, look, don't worry about it. She's 23 years old. She's, she's not stupid. She'll be all right. It'll be okay. But Adele was worried enough to dial 999. I said, my daughter's 23. Um, I don't believe she's run away from home, but she hasn't come home. She went out dressed in her pyjamas and dressing gown. And I'm very worried that she might have been involved in a car accident with her boyfriend. And he was driving a red Clio. That was the information that I knew. Four hours earlier, 23-year-old Adam Wheelahan had walked into a police station with blood on his hands. And officers were trying to make a connection between him and the body they'd found. It, it seems quite um, ironic, really, that we had a body that had been found in the road and somebody had handed himself in to say he was responsible for causing injuries to that person. Wheelahan told the officers the injuries occurred because he was trying to protect himself. When Adam Wheelahan was being spoken to by the Metropolitan Police officers, he said that she had taken possession of a multi-tool and she used that multi-tool to attack him. He defended himself and that's when she was subjected to the injuries. But for the team at the scene, Wheelahan's version of events didn't seem to ring true, as the woman appeared to have been stabbed at least 20 times. The Metropolitan Police contacted Kent Police to inform them of what the development they'd had at Bexley Heath Police Station. We were able to confirm that, in fact, we were dealing with what we considered to be a murder investigation. On that basis, Adam Wheelahan was arrested on suspicion of murder, and then my forensic strategy included forensic recovery of his clothing and, and a certain number of swabs to be taken from him, in particular his hands, which gave the, the impression that they had blood on them. But whose blood? After further questioning, Wheelahan finally admitted the name of the woman who died. He said Natalie Jarvis was the person who he'd attacked. Um, we also had a contact by Adele Jarvis, who was Natalie's mother, who was reporting Natalie as missing. From that, I was able to be virtually certain that this was all connected. Immediately, an officer was sent to the family's home. It was about half past seven. There was a knock at the door. Mark let him in. I was telling the man to sit down. He was a detective. I was opening the blinds. He was telling us to sit down. He said, uh, we found a body. And Del said to him, what has there been an accident? He said, unfortunately, I have to tell you, we believe your daughter's been murdered. And <sighs> never, never had anything like it. I didn't believe him. I remember screaming at him, how dare you? How dare you come into my house? and tell me that my daughter's dead when you don't even know what she looked like. And then he proceeded to tell us that Adam Wheelahan had handed himself in. It's just shock, it's just disbelief. You just, this is a nightmare. This is something you want to wake up from and this doesn't happen to you. This happens to somebody else. This is something you read about in the paper. That just took the wind right out of our sails and life ain't been the same since. Natalie was the younger of the Jarvis's two daughters and had worked at a local fast food restaurant since leaving school seven years ago. The biggest thing about Natalie was her laughter. Definitely her laughter. She was loud and bubbly, outgoing, beautiful, inside and out. Natalie was one of the most ebullient people you could ever wish to meet. When she walked into the room, Everybody's laughter levels went up, the noise levels went up, and the smiles went up. Loud, vivacious, bubbly. She was uh, oh, mischievous. M Natalie and I were very close. She weren't just my sister. I I've always said that. She was my best friend. Natalie was very sociable and had a large group of friends. She would go out often, um, whether it would just be to hang out where she was working with her friends, sitting in a car, whether they went to the pub or nightclubs around her sisters. She was forever on the phone. Uh, one time my husband walked in, in our office and she was on the landline, her mobile, and on the computer at the same time. 
Natalie was a one in a million person, you'd never meet anyone like her. She was one of the best friends you could ever ask for. Music was her first love. Her music was the loudest she could have it. Even if you walked past, you could hear it constantly. And it was always Westlife. Most of the time it was Westlife. <laughs> It seemed inconceivable that when the family saw Natalie the evening before, it would be the last time they'd see her alive. And they would now be helping the police to piece together her last movements. North Kent police had a man in custody, but exactly what had occurred on that fateful night? We knew the identification of the victim. We knew that Adam Wheeler had, had handed himself in. What we didn't know is what had actually happened to the build-up to, to that murder taking place. Natalie had been at work, but because the restaurant had been quiet, she'd finished an hour earlier than normal and was home by 10 p.m. And she came through the door, bouncing into the bedroom, and um, just said why she was early and that Adam was going to pick her up anyway at 11. But she finished early because it was a quiet shift. So she said she was going out with him to talk about going to the cinema the next night. Uh, they were going to see Taken 2 and she was going to ask if her friend Chelsea could go with her. And she went off for a shower, happy as anything. Got a pyjamas and dressing gown on. Bye, Mum, and off she went. Natalie worked shifts and would often head out whatever time she finished. Quite normal, and it's quite normal to go out in her pyjamas and dressing gown as well. If they weren't going anywhere, her and her friends, they would get in a car, sit in a car, go for a drive. It was quite normal. She'd go in, and in Asda or somewhere like that in her pyjamas and think nothing of it. Wasn't worried. She went out, she had just happy. Natalie had met Adam five years earlier in a local pub and exchanged numbers. Initially, he was just one of a large group of her friends. Over the those first few years, no, she wouldn't mention him much. There were so many of Natalie's friends who I didn't know or I might have just known by name. But towards the middle of 2012, definitely, his, his name was coming up a lot and she started going out a lot with him for eats and cinema and things like that. At the time of his arrest, Adam was working as a trainee telecoms engineer, but he used to work at a local supermarket. I would go in there and Natalie would come with me if she wasn't at work. And he was in the bakery and she'd say, I'm just going to go and speak to Adam for a bit or Ad for a bit. Um, and I saw him, glanced at him, didn't take too much notice. I would carry on doing my shopping and then she would catch up with me a bit later. Many a time I'd say, Nat, is he your boyfriend? Um, and she'd say, no, Mum, we're just friends. But it was more serious than we thought. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it was casual, but I don't know what his take on it was. She wasn't, there wasn't any, anyone else on the scene, as far as we were aware. It was always Ad, that's what she called him, Ad. <laughs> I knew that Natalie was going out and seeing Adam. She was nobody's fault. She certainly wouldn't have gone out if she thought she was in any danger. I believe she trusted him. I believe she felt quite um, safe with him quite secure. Adam Wheelahan claimed that it was Natalie that attacked him, and he was just trying to defend himself. In order to try and understand why, the police questioned her friends and family to establish the exact nature of their relationship. Adam Wheelahan and Natalie Jarvis, although not involved in a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, um, it was described to us that this was a relationship with benefits. Um, and by that, I mean that it was a sexual relationship. Um, that was something that we, that we did have to explore um, because we wanted to know exactly what the reasons behind this murder was. The police needed to know what prompted such a brutal attack between two supposedly close friends. What had gone so badly wrong between them on that fateful night? It was the day after Natalie Jarvis had been found stabbed several times in the neck in a quiet country lane in Swanley Village in Kent. 
We were told it was a murder investigation later on the same day, um, but at that stage, police would never confirm to us the victim or who she was. We were told that a man had handed himself in to police in connection with the death. The news was quickly spreading across the village. At the time, we realised that there was something serious happening and we were quite concerned and worried. It was absolutely shocking that this had happened. I had a phone call from my friend and she asked me if I was OK. And I said, yeah, I'm fine, why? And she said, oh, I've been really worried. There was a body found right near the pub you work at. Someone said to me, it was Natalie. And I said, no, it weren't, don't be stupid. And I remember ringing her and I said, Nat, can you just let me know you're all right? But someone rang me and told me what had happened and I, I just fell. So I couldn't get my head around how someone could be that angry with her or that upset with her that that sort of thing would happen. And I, don't, I still can't get my head around it. Natalie's friends headed to the scene of the crime to try and find out more information. It was all cordoned off and there was police everywhere and they said that we couldn't go down any further because there was forensics down there. So we just sat on the curb and waited and then they asked us to move away. It might be best to come back in a little while and we asked why and they said that they were going to remove her body and at that point the private ambulance drove past and we all just... We were just hysterical, we just, we couldn't believe it. It kind of sunk in then. Even though we couldn't see her, we just, we knew that she was in there and that she wasn't with us anymore. Although they had a suspect who was claiming self-defense, the police had to discover exactly what had gone on that night and find any possible motive for the killing. The forensic examination, as I would expect, was incredibly detailed this scene was effectively being examined for some considerable time during the following day. What was very evident from the blood distribution was that Natalie Jarvis had been moving from one side of the road in a staggered fashion, which clearly is very distressing. Forensic evidence showed Natalie had been stabbed around 20 times and the trail of her blood ran for some 148 metres so it looked like she might have been trying to flee her attacker. The detectives wanted to work out if she had tried to summon help. They knew that she'd have had her phone on her, so needed to find it. I put a specially trained search team into the area, and that search team were able to string back certain parts of, of the, the foliage that was against the road. and that phone was found not too far from where Natalie Jarvis had been found. It had been thrown into a bush. The phone had been damaged. Obviously, we were uncertain as to whether that was part of how uh, the phone had been thrown or was it done deliberately. The police already had a suspect in custody. Adam Wheelahan had been arrested on suspicion of Natalie's murder after he'd handed himself in around 2 a.m., three hours after Natalie had been declared dead. But he was claiming that he'd been acting in self-defense after Natalie attacked him. He'd originally spoken to Metropolitan officers in Bexley Heath, but later that day he was taken to North Kent Police Station and interviewed formally by the officers in charge of the case in the presence of a solicitor. Throughout the interview, Adam did not answer any questions, as is his right, and he answered no comment to all questions that were asked. Instead, Adam's solicitor read out a statement on his behalf, which officers hoped would give them answers. We were given very limited information, but effectively that Natalie was attacking him and he acted in self-defence. I found that very hard to believe because I was the, I'd actually seen Natalie by the side of the road and saw these dreadful injuries that she'd been subjected to. Um, and I thought that was just something that didn't seem to be right. In order to unravel what had actually gone on, the police started to trace his movements on the night of the murder. What we were able to ascertain as a, as a result of our investigation was that Adam was out that evening with a friend of his called Tom. We were very keen to speak to his friend Tom, um, and inquiries were made. The officers hoped that Tom would be able to shed some light on the events leading up to the attack. 
He was brought in for questioning at 6 p.m. the evening following Wheelerhan's arrest. What time did you go to bed? About half past 12. He surrendered the fact that he had Adam's mobile telephone and also the fact that he had um, Adam's car keys. So who did you sit up? Just normal people, the regulars. What we were also able to establish from, from Tom himself was that he'd made mention of the fact that he'd actually been in the boot at the time. This new information proved that Adam wasn't alone the night Natalie died. But it also threw up further questions for the officers. Why was Tom hiding in the boot? We can go over it again if you want. Tom came up with two different stories. The first of which was that the reason he was in the boot of the car was because that he was there for protection because Adam Wheelahan had told him that Natalie Jarvis had got a number of people who were after Adam. The story then changed to say that Natalie had been saying some awful things about Tom, whose father sadly had passed away, um, and that's the purpose he was there, to see if he could catch out what had been said by Natalie to Adam. I thought the boot scenario was incredibly bizarre and required further investigation. Hence the reason for sending Tom's clothes off for forensic examination to see if there was any form of blood distribution that would put him in close proximity of the attack of Natalie. But there wasn't any blood on Tom's clothes, so the officers were satisfied that he wasn't nearby when Natalie was attacked. But he was still a significant witness, and he was able to tell the officers where Adam had left his car. The same car that Natalie had been seen getting into around 10.30 p.m. the night she died. There was blood found within the vehicle, and that was on the steering wheel. But also, there was a multi-tool holder that was found in the driver's side door pocket, and that was you know, quite, quite significant, because we consider the multi-tool to be the weapon that had been used. What we were able to do as well is find some tracksuit bottoms that we believe were being worn by Adam at the time of the attack. And they were bloodstained. And there was also blood staining within the boot itself. The presence of Natalie's blood in the car confirmed that this was also the vehicle that was used to take her to the quiet village road where she had died. Adam had admitted that an attack had happened, but claimed it was Natalie who attacked him first. The police, however, believed the evidence was pointing in a different direction. And just two days after her body was found, Adam Wheelahan was charged with the murder of Natalie Jarvis. A week later, following further inquiries, his friend Tom was also charged with murder. With two men now in custody, Natalie's family and friends were finally able to pay their respects and at the same time celebrate Natalie's all too short a life. In her coffin, which she looked like an angel. <laughs> she still looked like my baby. <laughs> but her, her funeral was, was massive. There was just so many people. She, she would have loved it, actually. It was like a big party. There were just so many people, so many flowers. She was so popular, she was loved by so many people, more than I realised. We did Natalie proud. It was a party, and that's what Natalie would have wanted. I'd agreed with Gemma and Del that I was going to do the eulogy. Didn't know whether I could do it or not, but I was determined it was going to be me. When I looked out at the number of people that were in that chapel, it was phenomenal. We knew Natalie was popular, but by God, didn't expect that at all. Nobody should have to bury their child. And now she's, she's here in our home and she'll stay with us. She's in a teardrop urn. It's silver. Natalie's favourite colour was silver. She wore silver jewellery. But she'll stay with us. Once the funeral was over, Natalie's family needed answers. Why had their much-loved daughter been murdered in such a brutal and horrific fashion?
Adam Wheelahan, friend and lover of Natalie Jarvis, had been charged with brutally murdering her in a quiet road in Swanley Village in Kent, and the local community was still reeling. This case was particularly shocking because it was someone who was so young that had been killed, and it was someone who had been killed by someone that she knew, someone that she probably trusted. It was all the more shocking, the actual, the way that the young lady died. I don't think the community has ever experienced that sort of crime here. That, that was the real shock to it. Six months after Natalie's cruel death, Adam Wheelahan and his friend Tom went to trial for her murder. Both pleaded not guilty. When we heard Adam's version of events say that Natalie had gone for him and stuff, that and that she'd had a knife, um, no, we knew 100% that she wouldn't have had a multi-tool. Um, we knew 100% that she wouldn't even know what one was. As the trial began at Maidstone Crown Court on the 3rd of April 2013, the facts of that fateful evening started to emerge. We heard as the trial went on that um, Adam had picked up Natalie from her home on the night that she died. They'd driven out towards the Swanley Village area. That's where the incident itself actually happened. Natalie was then stabbed numerous times with the knife from a multi-tool that Wheelahan said he kept in the car because at the time of his arrest, he was training to be a telecoms engineer. But why had Natalie been attacked? Wheelahan's defence team claimed that he was acting in lawful self-defence. He said that the multi-tool was kept in his glove box. He claimed that Natalie got the multi-tool out of the glove box and started attacking him with it. Um, so a complete role reversal, really. He claimed that he was the one being attacked. He said he was the victim and he was the one being attacked. And he said that he went on to stab Natalie because he feared for his life. So why was he so fearful? As part of his case, Wheelahan's defence argued that Natalie was delusional about their relationship and that they were not going out as boyfriend and girlfriend. Alec was making out that um, Natalie was responsible for a barrage of text messages and harassing him over an extended period of time. This was quite surprising to see some of that because in the text messages that Adam was replying to, he would be putting crosses inferring he was giving kisses, so therefore in, almost encouraging the further contact. And nothing did he ever say in any text message, don't bother contacting me again, I don't want to hear from you again. He never did any of that. It was a story that Natalie's family also found hard to believe. He said she was harassing him. She wasn't harassing him. She was going out with him. There wasn't a label on their relationship, but she wasn't harassing him. They were eating out regularly. Sometimes she paid, sometimes he paid, like a couple. You, you wouldn't do those things if there wasn't a relationship. And further details were emerging as to why Wheelahan felt so-called pressure from Natalie. There was a story that went along the lines of how Natalie had told um, Adam she was pregnant and implying that he would have been the father to this child. It was actually a fabricated story that Natalie had um, invented. And this is one of the, was one of the arguments Adam put forward, saying that um, he was stressed and under a lot of pressure because he felt he was about to be a father. When Natalie was at the post-mortem, we asked that very question, can the pathologist confirm if she was pregnant and she wasn't pregnant? Now, we will never know if she felt she was pregnant and, you know, it, we, we don't know the reasons for that. Um, and it sounds very strange that she would do that. Um, but equally, if Nat Adam um, Wheelahan thought that she was pregnant, not only did he kill Natalie Jarvis, but he killed Natalie Jarvis's baby as well. Wheelahan's friend Tom was also facing a murder charge. At court, he admitted being at the scene, but denied seeing anything. We know on that night that Adam had been out with his friend Tom in the sick-up area. They'd been to a couple of pubs, they'd been to driving range. Tom was in the boot of the car. During the course of the trial, we heard that he was in the boot of the car because Adam was worried that he could be attacked when he was collecting Natalie. So therefore, Tom was hidden in the boot to protect him as kind of like a bit of self-defense. Tom's defense centered around a psychiatrist report which said that he was easily led and mentally less capable. It's still a bit unclear as to exactly how Tom was during, um, as Natalie was killed. Um, we heard that I think he got out of the boot 
Um, but we don't know exactly when he got out of the boot, what prompted him to get out of the boot, or what he saw. While the defence portrayed Wheelerhan as a man fearful for his life, the prosecution painted a very different picture of what they believed happened that night. They presented evidence that Wheelerhan had lured Natalie out of her home at 10.30 p.m. on October the 3rd, 2012, with the intention of murdering her, with his friend Tom in the boot as a getaway driver. Once they had arrived at an isolated location, Wheelerhan and Natalie got out of the car. CCTV footage then showed Tom moving the car. He also got out, but there was no evidence that he had inflicted the wounds. Instead, the prosecution alleged that it was Wheelerhan who had stabbed Natalie at least 20 times with a multi-tool. The prosecutor described it as a brutal, frenzied attack. Adam just appeared motionless in the dock. He didn't seem to react in particular to anything. A lot of the time he had his head in his hands whilst um, information was being read out. He wasn't particularly reacting to anything at all. The prosecution then went on to say that after leaving Natalie's body on the side of the road at around 11 p.m., Adam changed his blood-soaked clothes, went and bought alcohol, and relaxed with his friends before handing himself in at Bexley Heath Police Station at 10 past two in the morning. The location itself was vast, so at the trial, the police used graphical imaging software to create a virtual crime scene. That was incredibly beneficial at the trial because sometimes for, for a murder trial we do take the jury to the scene to conduct a scene visit. This wasn't necessary because of the recreation of the scene by the, um, by the scene scanning. The jury were able to see that the crime scene measured 148 metres from where the first spot of blood was found to where Natalie's body lay. The blood trail also gave the impression that Natalie had been staggering from side to side. It was distressing to hear, but there was more. It seemed that um, Adam had been going around after the incident, immediately afterwards, before he handed himself in, telling um, his friends that Natalie called out that she was dying and she wanted her mum to be with her. She knew she was dying and she wanted, him, she wanted Adam to ring my mum because she was dying and and he wouldn't, and he didn't. It was just savage beyond belief, and sickens you to the pit of your stomach, really does. Not, not just my daughter, but anybody to suffer like that. It's shocking. And there were further revelations to come. The police had accessed Wheelerhan's text messages to his friends as well as his postings on social media accounts from the months leading up to Natalie's death. He posted one that um, had a hashtag with its own murderous mind and he was posting things on social media suggesting that he'd been thinking about killing someone. And um, there was a whole series of string of these messages on his account that when we accessed that after he'd been charged. To hear this, this plan of my daughter's murder being, to a certain extent, broadcast it was unbelievable. These people were talking about, about my child like she was nothing. They referred to her in obscene terms. Horrible. He did try and explain that perhaps he was just thinking out loud. He was, um, he wasn't, he, he, he argued that he wasn't writing it with any intention. He was just writing it as kind of how he felt. And two and a half months before the murder, Adam made his feelings clear when he wrote, it's all right to kill someone these days, isn't it? Think I might do that. 
it was evident on all forms of social media that um, this was premeditated um, and so much so that that really built a big picture for us to say this wasn't a spur of the moment self-defence angle, um, this was all about the fact that he wanted to kill Natalie Jarvis. Local interest in the case was huge. Our readers were glued to the trial and they were interested to find out um, why she was killed and by whom. It took three weeks for all the evidence to be heard. And finally, on the 24th of April, 2013, the jury were sent out to decide if Adam and his friend Tom were guilty of murdering Natalie. Well, I went to the court date pretty much every day. And that day, I remember we waited for ages. It, was, it just seemed like we waited for a week, sitting there just waiting for them to come, like the jury to come back. But in fact, it took the jury only four hours to reach a verdict. They decided that Tom was not guilty of murder and he walked free from court. However, they unanimously decided that Adam Wheelahan did murder Natalie and he was sentenced to 26 years in prison. You know, I was always intending to get Adam Wheelahan found guilty of murder because of what he did to Natalie Jarvis. It took the life of a young woman um, who had, was a very popular young girl, um, loved by all her friends and family, and it's destroyed them. We don't feel any elation that he's been away for 26 years. It's not going to bring our Natalie back. It was kind of like a relief that like we didn't have to fight for that anymore, and that everyone knew what he'd done, and that. He couldn't do it again. Like other people were safe, he couldn't do that again. But despite having sat through the ordeal of the trial, the family still feel they are no closer to understanding why Wheelahan took it upon himself to murder Natalie. As a family, we have got so many questions. And I don't think we'll ever find out why. And people were just shocked that someone had gone out of their way to kill her for seemingly no reason as well. And even at the end of the trial, there's no real reason as to why um, Natalie was killed on that night. A year on from that fateful night when the life of a young woman was taken in a senseless manner, Natalie Jarvis remains in the forefront of the mind of this small village community that has been changed forever. I think it's still very much people's minds because there's a little shrine to it there, so I don't think people will forget it. Very, very sad. Just hope it never happens again. I think anyone that knew Natalie, even if they didn't know her that well, they'll miss something about her. I know that I'm not going to find another friend like her. That's it, like to be remembered as just the fun, lovable person she was. She was very lovable. She was a beautiful person in many ways. She was kind. She loved people, she loved everybody, and she wanted everybody to love her. And luckily, we believe they all did. I hope that Natalie, her senseless death, brings home to everybody just how precious life is. You can't bear grudges. You can't let things fester. And I think Natalie has taught people to love more, forgive more, and get on with your life and enjoy your life. And I'm positive that people have taken that from Natalie's passing. So I'm proud of every minute my daughter spent on this planet. She was phenomenal. And me, her sister, her mum loved her to pieces. And we miss her so terribly. We really do. Pick a place where ghosts like to hang out, then join us on Monday at 10 to go hunting for them. A haunting is new.